Today, this video will go through some of the basics of using ProSystems Engagement. First, you will locate the shortcut on your desktop and double-click to open the program. You will enter your login name and password that were provided to you, and you will choose Office as your location. When you are in Office mode, you are able to sync back to our network, our central file room. If for some reason you do not have access to the internet and are unable to sync to the central file room, you may work in field mode. But if you are in field mode, you want to make sure that as soon as possible you are able to get onto a stable internet connection and change your location back to office and then resync the binder so that all of your work is backed up and saved on our network. So once again, office is the preferred location that you would want to set. If for some reason after you hit OK, you get a pop-up window that asks you for the name of the server, you will need to type in DB02 for the server name. Now once you're in this view, you will notice that there are three window panes that we will be using. The top left is my local file room. Only things that are in my local file room are, are the ones that I have the ability to make any changes or modifications to any of those work papers. The bottom left are all of our CFRs, our central file rooms. The central file room that will be used the most often will be the St. Louis central file room. If you double click on that, you will be able to see each of the binders that are available to us in that file room. You can search the central file room by either the client number by clicking down here and then typing the client number, or if you know the client's name but you're not sure of their number, you can click on this top line, St. Louis Center Forum DB02, and then if you click in the window pane to the right, you can actually type in the client name. The binder that we will be using for this training today, I've already downloaded, and so I'm going to click here to choose the client folder, and then within that client folder, there can be multiple binders. Each binder is, in theory, one binder per period that we are reporting on. Since this is a training binder, the name and the ID is slightly different. But typically what you would see would under the name column, you would see the client's name again. The ID is going to be the year of the, the year end of the engagement. So typically 1231 and in most cases for this year 17. So 123117. The letter at the end of the ID will signify what kind of engagement it is. So A for audit, R for review, C for comp, and so on. So for an audit binder, you would see 123117A. And then the type is chosen whenever that binder is created. Choose audit. It's in process because the binder is open and we can actively work on it. Once an audit is completed, we are required to finalize that binder. So you will notice that the status on those binders will change. The lead partner is also chosen whenever we set up the binder. The year end is also created from the binder properties, which includes also the period end that we set. And then the due date is also another option to set whenever we are creating the binder. You can see all those things are also, if you right click and go to the binder properties, you can see the name of the binder, the binder ID, which like I said, in most cases you'll have um, something to signify the date and the binder engagement type. The due date can be modified and the lead partner can also be changed if that needs to be adjusted. The periods are set here as your beginning date and your end date and your year end. This dates tab is completed at the logout stage by somebody within our administrative team, so you should not need to do anything with that particular tab. If you're looking for history, you can see um, anything of whenever the, usually this shows whenever the binder was created or whenever it's finalized, so you should not have to do anything on this history tab either. And then the binder staff shows you everybody who is allowed to synchronize this binder. So let's go ahead and open it up. So our binder has opened successfully. The one thing I want to go back and show you on the central file room is the synchronization job queue. You want to look to make sure that the status after you sync is always completed. If it says failed, that means the sync did not work at all. It could also show partially failed, which means that some of the work papers sunk back to the network properly and some did not. If you see anything other than complete, you will want to try and redo that sync. If the binder is a prior year binder that you're opening and it has been finalized per our standards, you will actually see um, a status saying that it did not sync to the central file room, and that's because any binder that's been finalized does not do an active sync or does not perform an active sync. 
If you would like to get back to the synchronization job queue window and it's not currently showing as it's not right now, you can always go back to view and then choose sync queue. One other piece whenever we're in the central file room look is to go to tools and to options and a couple settings that you're going to want to change from the default. I, we recommend that you check the first two boxes so that your binders will automatically express synchronize to the central file room whenever you open it and whenever you close it. And that ensures that you're always looking at the most recent version of the work papers and whenever you close the binder that all of your changes and revisions are reflected with what's on the network. I also recommend unchecking the auto open last used binder because you don't always necessarily want to open the last binder that you were using. So now we will go back to our binder that we are using for our training. One other thing to point out also in the central file room view is the properties on the client. So this is the client folder as I said and these are the different binders that are available within the client folder. Click on the client folder and go down to properties. You'll be able to see this is where we can adjust the client ID and we can uh, choose the put in the client name. You will notice too that we do list the client name twice. The client name one should be upper and lowercase and client name two should be all uppercase. We use that for whenever we link our financial statements. We want to make sure that wherever possible we're linking names and dates for consistency so we make sure that we don't have any errors in naming in any of the parts of our financials. Hit OK and go back to our binder. So our binders are set up in a tab structure and so you will see and we will have another training about the typical tab structure that Miller Prost used but this binder is set up with those. So you'll see within each tab there are sub tabs that we use to house each of our work papers and we have standards as to what we typically put into each section for consistency and making it easier for individuals to be able to find work papers within a binder. You'll notice also too the sign off details in these three columns prepared by first reviewer and second reviewer if that is necessary. These two buttons up here are helpful. This is expand all and collapse all. If you expand all you'll be able to see all the work papers that are currently available in the binder. This training handout is the one piece that you will not see in a typical binder, but we put these pieces in here. I recommend reading all of them. They contain a lot of very helpful and useful information. But we're, for now, we're going to go ahead and minimize those. In this view, you can see the prepared by that, on this case, I prepared this work paper. And you'll see. Here, and it gives my initials and the date that I signed off. Let's say that somebody else prepared a different work paper and ignore that it's my initials and I wanted to come through as a second, as the first reviewer, the person who is responsible for saying that work paper has been reviewed and is complete, I would then choose to sign off as first reviewer. The same person is not allowed to be in the prepared by and reviewed by column, so keep that in mind as well. The file modify date shows us the last time that there are any revisions made to the work paper and then the current editor shows who currently has the work paper checked out from the central file room. You are only able to modify or make changes to any work papers that you have the current rights checked out to. If you don't have the rights, it will show as unassigned and the work paper's title will be gray. Will be gray. Same thing goes that if somebody else in the firm has the work paper checked out, it will show as gray just like this one does, but instead of saying unassigned, it will list that person's name. Another feature that our firm uses are, is the notes feature. So If you're the reviewer, say review point, and then you will type whatever the point may be for that person. And you will hit OK. 
And let's say that I, as the preparer, came back and saw that the review point was there and available for me. I have now made the changes and addressed that work paper. Then I would come back through and I'm going to right click down here in this pane and choose Clear Note. The one thing we have to make sure is that as the reviewers leave review points in the binders that they notify the preparer that those review points are there. And the same thing goes for if the preparer has cleared review points, they need to make sure that they are notifying the reviewer that the points have been cleared and that everything is ready to go back to the reviewer for another look. Once the reviewer has gone back through that work paper and, and believes that they are now good with the revisions to the work paper and it is complete, they will right click and delete their own work paper note and then sign off as a reviewer on that work paper. You want to choose do not, dis if you see this window pop up, choose do not display this message again. You do not want to log the work paper and you do not want to freeze engagement links. But as I said, we're not allowed to have the same person in both the prepare and the reviewer sign off sections, even though the system will allow it. So for now, and I can actually hit the minus sign next to the window that corresponds with where I would like to remove my sign off. If you want another way to sign off on work papers, it, besides just clicking on sign off as prepare, you can go actually to the sign off work paper properties and hit the plus sign to have your sign off populate that window. One other piece to mention about the notes is that if I can do one again, and I hit OK. Somebody else can also come back through and respond to the review point and say completed. Or if they answer the question, that's another way that you can do that. So I'm going to go Because we use those comments as our vehicle for review points, that you want to keep an eye on them, respond to them, and then clear them as quickly as possible. And once again, make sure you're notifying those individuals that you're working with whether or not there are review points out there or whether or not they've been addressed. Next, we will go through how to insert a new work paper into your binder. So let's go down to the asset section of the binder. And let's say that we received a new bank reconciliation from the client. So we're going to right click on the tab and we are going to choose new work paper from file and I'm going to browse to wherever it is on my computer and I'm going to pick this bank reconciliation PVC. And in this case I'm going to give it an index number. As you can see all of our cash work papers start with an A and I'm going to go with the next one in sequence which would be A.03. Hit OK and then it is now part of my work papers. Another way to insert a work paper, let's say that I just need to draft a new memo or I just need a blank Word or Excel file I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose new work paper from template. And then that will allow me to choose one of those blank files. You can choose blank Word document, blank Excel document if you need a new PowerPoint presentation pulled into the binder, or a manual work paper. Manual work papers are those where you just need to make a permanent comment like no attorney letter or no whatever. Um, and they're usually the manual work papers, however, do not get used that often. But in this case, I'm going to choose a blank Word document. And I'm going to choose the next point in the sequence because I'm putting it into my cache section. And I'm going to say listing of banks or clients. Because let's say that we wanted to have one list that included the list of all the banks that this client has and I wanted to add this listing in there. This is one way to do it and then I would just open up the work paper and type accordingly. And I'm going to go ahead and close this file. Every time you close the file it's going to ask you if you want to save. And one thing of note, as I mentioned before, you're only able to save work papers that you have the rights to. If you try to open something, um, you are able to open and view things that you don't have the rights to. So in this case, this unassigned work paper, I'm going to go ahead and open it. 
and I'm going to get an error message to tell me that, or at least a warning to let me know that it is read only. There is another option for another work paper, and that is a placeholder. So this is the case where you know you need something, but you haven't received it yet, so you'd like to put a placeholder in there. So for example, the 1600 section is where we house our engagement letters. So I'm going to put a placeholder in there for the engagement letter. I'm not going to sign off on that yet because we don't want to do that until we've actually received that work paper. And you can see the difference that it looks like a little book with blue. That's the sign that it is a placeholder. If you were to choose that manual work paper that was mentioned earlier, it would look like this book, but the page that's turning would be red. So let's say now you've received that signed engagement letter and I want to be able to replace this place to change it out for this placeholder. I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose replace placeholder and I'm going to browse to wherever that signed engagement letter is on my computer and then hit OK and they will automatically convert that file over from a placeholder to the file that I'm inserting. You also have the ability to insert work papers directly from Outlook. You can, if you double click and open up the particular email, you can click on the file within that email. You can drag and drop the file onto a tab within the engagement binder and it will pull up the window and ask you to give it an index number and a name. There's also at the top ribbon of the Outlook there's an add-ins ribbon and in that add-ins ribbon there's an engagement drop-down and one of those engagement drop-down options is to insert file or to insert the email into the engagement binder and if that's the case that you choose you will then be prompted to another window where you will choose the client and the binder in which you want to insert that work paper. Unfortunately the computer that this training is being recorded on does not have Microsoft Outlook loaded on it so I'm unable to show that particular piece of the training but whenever you um, have that option please see your coach and he or she should be able to easily show you how to do that how to use that feature with within the integration between Microsoft Outlook and engagement as mentioned previously, synchronization is the way that we put our files, or at least an image of the files, back on our network or on our central file room. So as you are able to finish a section, um, it's always a good thing to make sure that you check work papers back in so that they can be reviewed and other people can see the progress that you've done. You can check in a work paper one at a time by right-clicking and choosing Check In Work Paper. You can also check an entire section in by right-clicking on the tab and choosing check in work paper. In this case it will choose all three work papers that I have the rights to. It will give me the option to check them all in at one time and you'll see here in just a second that the current editor has now changed from my name to unassigned. The other thing that you can do is if a coworker of yours is working on this work paper and you don't need the rights but you just want to be able to see what they've done you can also just right click on the work paper and choose synchronize work paper and then it will synchronize it to the central file room so you can see that you have the most recent version up to date. That also is contingent upon the fact that whoever was working on that file that they've sunk before you so that their changes get saved to the central file room and then whenever you do your synchronization you are able to pick up those changes and be able to view them. And while we are on the topic of synchronization let's go back to our central file room view and look at the different synchronization options that we have. When we click on our client name and then the binders that are available under that client name, these buttons up here are some of our shortcuts for synchronization. This one right here is to synchronize the entire binder. And it won't let me do that right now because I have the binder open, but we can synchronize this other business services training binder. So I will click on the synchronize binder window. I will hit next. It chooses the training center file room because that's what it's on. You want to synchronize the entire binder. If for some reason you only wanted to synchronize a certain section, you could check this radio dial and then you will choose which work papers you want to sync. But typically you will choose synchronize entire binder and hit next. If you want to check out any of the work papers at this time, you can actually check them all out by clicking up top. Or if I see you say I just want particular sections, you can choose those as well. 
and then you would hit the next button. If you had any work papers checked out, there would be another window that would come up giving you the option to check in any work papers. So just very careful, you need to be very careful to look to see whether you are choosing the option to check in or check out. And then you'll hit the synchronization button. One other option you have is to check this box here and that will make it open the binder as soon as the synchronization is complete. The other option you have is what's called an express synchronization. So if you click on that button, it automatically just starts to sync the binder without changing the rights to any of the work papers. So nothing gets checked in and nothing gets checked out. If you don't want to use the buttons up top, you can also right click and get to those exact same options of synchronize binder, express, synchroniza express synchronization. So the other thing to notice too is that this business services training binder is just an open book which means it can be modified it's not a finalized binder this video copy because it has that blue arrow that blue arrow signifies that I have work papers checked out in that binder and if I wanted to check in every work paper that I had you can go up here to this option and click on check in all work papers or if I wanted to check out every work paper in that binder I could choose this option of check out all work papers one other way to see how many binders you have work papers checked out on is to go to this engagement today view. So if you click on that button right there, it takes you to this other view and you can choose binders with checked out work papers and click on the triangle and you will see that I have work papers checked out in this training business services binder, which is the video copy of it. To go back to the other view, you're going to go back and click on client index and it takes you back to the view that we were in previously. Next, we're going to go through the basic binder setup for Miller Prost binders. In this training and handouts material, you'll see that there is a file that will also go through the things that we're discussing. So if you're ever not sure, please make sure you use this as a reference because it's got a lot of great information. But it does break it down by section within a standard binder. So in the 1100 section, we're going to close this thousand the zero 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 section so the eleven the one thousand section is our planning and general section the eleven hundred section is usually is where we put all of our planning documents which would be engagement acceptance our budget our fee analysis and our planning meeting agendas the twelve hundred section is where the analytical procedures are thirteen hundred is where we put all of our risk assessment fourteen hundred will be for our general checklist so there are two general checklists plus the supervision and review Confirmation controls in the 1500 section. Seventeen hundred section are our carry forward work papers for correspondence to the client. So the word file for the engagement letter and the representation letter. If we have carry forward suggestions for the previous year, things that might make the audit more efficient, and um, we'll put them into this work paper here. Also a one fourteen letter that needs to be issued at the end of each engagement. We keep the template also in the seventeen hundred section. And the same thing for, like I said, the rep letter. If there's a comment letter, we usually put that into another section. And then the 1900 section is where we will house all of our internal control um, understanding and test work. So that is the 1000 section. So we will go ahead and plus minus to the left to uh, expand or minimize each respective section. So now we're going to go through the 2000 section, which is our reporting. We have our financial statements, which are the Word and the Excel file, into the 2100 section. You'll see in this sample binder we actually have two sets of financial statements um, and if you want you can expand so we can see the full name. We have an example of a client that's a nonprofit, and then we have an example of a for-profit client. We also put the docket for all of our engagements in this 2100 section and the docket gives all the basic information for the preparer, the reviewer, and everything else that we need in order for the logout process for our engagements. You will see this particular Microsoft pop-up window um, on many of the work papers due to some of the add-ins. You can just choose do not, don't update. 
When you fill out your dockets, you will fill out the client name, the binder ID, which corresponds, to, which is what's listed actually on the binder, the period and date. You'll pick the client number, and then you want to make sure that we have the right AICPA industry code. So in this case, the one that's came from was a non-for-profit organization. You'll also choose the proper engagement type, which has a drop-down to choose from. You will choose your basis of accounting, also via a drop-down. The budgeted financial statement hours will come from the budget that's in the 1100 section. The report date will be filled out at the end of the engagement when we know what that date is. We have to do the drop down to say whether it's coming out of our St. Louis, St. Charles, or California office. We'll have to choose whether it's a first year engagement or not. We'll have to choose whether or not there are foreign operations in that engagement, yes or no. And then the presentation type is consolidated, combined, or not applicable. So if you don't have either of these first two, you will choose not applicable. And then whenever you finish preparing the financial statements, you will type in your initials here and the date in which you finished preparing those financial statements. The other piece to remember too, this manually footed, after the completion of each of the financial statements and before they move into the detail review stage, each preparer is required to manually foot down and cross foot all of the financial statements using um, a calculator or a 10 key to make sure that we don't have any errors in the math on that because sometimes if a row or a column is hidden, the formula may still be correct, but it might be grabbing something that the um, person cannot see when, whenever the financial statements are being printed or looked at on screen. The other pieces in the 2000 section, financial we usually have one work paper that is a summary of all of our disclosures to kind of make it a little um, one-stop place for where to find what's supporting the different pieces of the, of the notes. The disclosure checklist will go into the 2300 section. All the research that we use for the engagement, which would be research for the engagement letter, research for the representation letter, research for the auditor's report, and any other piece that's deemed necessary goes into this 2400 section. The 2500 section is if we are issuing a management comment letter to the client, we will include the letter template here as well as the work papers that we used to summarize and accumulate those points. And then the last piece here is the 2900 section, that's our deliverables. So whenever we issue the financial statements, we will put a final PDF copy of the financial statements in all letters, um, whether they be the 114 letter or a comment letter or a transmittal letter to the client. PDF copies all go into this 2900 section. The 3000 section is our trial balance section. So the TB database, which is what we will import into, is right here. The TB database is where all numbers get pulled from for the rest of the binder. The TB report is a summarized version of what's in the TB database. So it will be grouped um, by the way that we have kind of set whenever we get to our account groupings, which we will address later. The 3200 section includes all of our journal entry reports. So any adjusting journal entries we propose will show up on this report. Past adjustments proposed this one and classifying adjustments proposed on this one. The standard rule of thumb is, is that if it's an adjustment that we want the client to make, we're going to record it as an adjusting journal entry. If it's something that we are recording just for financial statement purposes only and we do not believe the client needs to book that entry, we're going to put that into the reclassifying journal entries report. And then if it's something that we've noted as an error but it's not material to the financials as a whole and we are passing on making that adjustment, we will book a past adjustment and that will flow to the past adjustments report. If a client has compliance requirements, so if they are receiving money from the federal government or they are a HUD project or have some other compliance that we have to test, you will actually see a 4000 tab. This sample binder does not have that because this particular one does not have any compliance requirements that we have to test, so there is no 4000 section. But if you see a 4000 section in a binder, that is what it's for. All of our assets are housed in the 5000 section and each of the respective types of assets are corresponded with a letter. So typically cash start with an A. If you've got accounts receivable, it's going to start with a C. If you've got intercompany receivables, that's going to be a D. 
If you've got inventory, that's going to be an F. If you've got prepaid assets, that will be G. If you've got job cost reports, that will be J. If you have fixed assets or property and equipment, that will be M. If other assets will fall into L, and that is typically all that you will see, and then other assets will fall into the X section. If you have a type of an asset and there isn't already a sub tab for that, so let's say this client right now last year didn't have prepaid, so there's no G to add one because this year they truly have prepaids. I'm going to right click on the asset tab, I'm going to choose new tab, and I'm going to put the letter G as the index name. Next we're going to go through the liabilities and equity section. So typically in this section if there were a line of credit that would be a BB. Accounts payable we use that tab as CC. If there's a crude payroll it will be FF. If it is all other expenses it will be HH. If it's long-term debt it will be MM. If you've got capital leases, NN. If you've got preferred, sorry, not preferred, deferred income, it's PP. And then other um, for 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 profit and net assets for nonprofit go into the ZZ section. Income, of revenue, and expense items are in the O one hundred for revenue and O four in these analytical work papers um, that go through review of possibly repairs and maintenance or review of legal fees, um, reasonableness tests on interests and revenues in these two respective sections typically. And so if we are preparing the tax return for the client, which typically we prepare the returns for the clients that we perform financial statement engagements on, then those work papers will go into the 8,000 section. Standard, what we about the different tabs with this binder also has a setup for subsidiary um, entities. So if you have a consolidated binder and you, so you've got your subsidiaries to report, you'll mark them as S1, the, the name S2, and then you will repeat the, the corresponding tabs under subsidiary sections. Next, we're going to go through the process of how to import a client trial balance into our trial balance database. So the first thing that you're going to need is a trial balance from the client. PBC for us stands for, for prepared by client. So you're going to want to open it after it's already been pulled into the binder. And you'll pull it. Saved on your computer. You work paper from file or you want to start prepared by client to original format and change the tab name to say PBC and then we're going to make a copy of that tab and the reason we have to do that is that we have to have the trial balance formatted in a certain way in order to be able to import it into our engagement system. And that is in one column by itself. The, the numbers are also in one column by themselves with all of your debit entries as positive and all of your credit entries as negative numbers. So in this case, with this particular client, they had debits and credits in separate columns, so we had to reformat the trial balance to, in order to be able to get those into one column. This particular trial balance also came out of QuickBooks, so we had to eliminate the beginning part of this particular account number because all we wanted to do was pull over the 8202 for the account number and building loan interest for the account description. So using text to column and other various Excel 
tools and tricks, we were able to get them all, all the account numbers into one column and all the descriptions to another column, and then all of the numbers into one column on their own with debits as positive and credits as negative, which is what we're all used to seeing. So after we've done this reformatting of the client trial balance, we want to make sure we go all the way down to the bottom and put a sum figure in there to make sure that it all sums to zero. The other thing that we want to do is do a net income check. So we're going to do a summation of all of our revenue and expense numbers. Most clients, based upon their client, based upon the account number, you can tell whether or not it is a revenue or an expense account, um, asset, liability, and so on and so forth. Most clients want something with a one is an asset that starts with a one is an asset, something that starts with a two is a liability, three is something in the equity section, four is a revenue, and five is their expenses. For this particular client, they did have some of their revenue numbers starting with a one, which is why they, we highlighted them in yellow just or orange just so they would stand out. And we want to make sure that as you can see by the red box around here that we did grab those in our calculation of the total net income to use as our edit check. The other thing to be mindful as you're formatting the trial balance in order to get it ready to input is that we have to be careful that there are no duplicate account numbers and no duplicate account names because that will cause a problem whenever we begin the import process. Now that we've reformatted our prepared by client trial balance and we're ready to import, we are going to go back to the binder view for this particular client and we're going to open up the TB database. And you can tell that it's the database because it's the only one in the binder that has this symbol to the left of the index number and name. This particular binder does have two TB databases because of the way that, uh, to, in order to be able to pull one in for, to show for an example, and this is a for-profit one, this is a non-profit one. Most binders only have one. You'll, if your binder is a single presentation of one client, you will just have one TB database. If you have consolidated financial statements, you will have multiple TB databases that you'll be working with. So if that's the case, please make sure you are choosing the correct TB database to work with. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the NFP because that's the prepared by client trial balance that I'm working with. So now that I've got it open, I'm going to minimize it and I'm going to take and I'm going to highlight the first three, the three columns of information from this reformatted file. I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose copy and I'm going to go back over to my database and I'm going to right click anywhere and I'm going to choose to paste TB import. So now that this window has come up we have to identify um, what the columns are. So we're going to make sure that, so that one defaulted to account so that's correct. That one defaulted to description so that is also correct. And then the V means we haven't that it hasn't either figured out um, and we haven't chosen what the particular column is called. So in this case, I have to choose what it's called, and this is I'm going to choose current, and I'm going to choose unadjusted balance. Every time we import a client trial balance, we always call it the unadjusted balance because in that way, if we book any journal entries to it, um, we know where we started with with their numbers. Now, whenever you are going through this paste TB import, we always want to round to the nearest dollar. We always want to have the radio dial chosen for append, and we do have to select a rounding account. And um, we usually, if there's one in there, there may not be, we can create a new rounding account, round to new account, and usually we just choose all nines and, choose, and just type the word rounding. Same. So now we have, we have chosen, we picked that account number is the correct title for this column, description is the correct title for this column, and unadjusted balance is the correct title for this column. We made sure that append is the rated all that's been chosen. We are rounding to the nearest dollar and we have selected our rounding account. We are now choose next. Hit OK. And then hit OK again. And sit and be patient for a second. And then choose finish. And now you will see that the client's numbers have now imported into the unadjusted column for the financial statements. And we are now going to scroll to the very bottom 
of this. And then as, as an edit check, you want to make sure that the total always comes down to zero down here. That tells us that we imported correctly and that we didn't have any other errors. Um, and that the TB that we were importing was also in balance, which is one of the reasons why, too, we do the sum at the bottom of the TB import file to make sure that everything sums to zero. The other thing that we will check is whether or not this total net income or loss agrees to the total net income or loss that we were expecting from our client prepared trial balance. So $101,398 is what the TB database is currently showing as our net income or loss. But if I go back over to my prepared by client, I see 131,239. So that tells me that something in my trial balance is not properly grouped. And I will explain what that is in just a second. So whenever new accounts are imported in, we have to group them within our account groupings that we have. And that is how the system knows what kind of account it is. Is it an asset, a revenue, a liability, an expense, or something with equity? So I'm going to go to the Engagement tab up top. I'm going to go to Account Groupings. And even if those two match, you always still want to go to this Account Groupings just to make sure that all accounts have been grouped. So as you can see, I have two accounts here on the left that currently have not been grouped. The other thing of note too is that you can see that I'm working in the TB-NFP TB database. You can see too, because we have other databases available in this binder, I could look at any of the other one. I could look at the other TB, which was fully grouped. But in this case, I'm working on the TB-NFP. There also are different um, groupings that we can do. So lead and sublead, that is the grouping that is related to the financial statements that we use to link our financial statements as we go through our process. There's also the groupings for the tax return. And so those are tie back to the tax return themselves. So what we're going to focus on today is the lead and sublead groupings. So we have two accounts that have not been grouped. This option here is a nice feature because you can find out how much is in the dollar amount. I'm not sure why it's cutting off the last number there. But you can see that the donations were zero, so that's not causing our problem. But my health insurance, that's what's causing my problem. But we want to go ahead and group both of them because just in case that donations account is used by the client again in the future. So there are, multi there are a couple different ways that we can move them from this left window pane over to the right, which are our groupings. So you have the same buttons we're used to seeing before, either expand groupings list or collapse groupings list. So I'm going to actually click on this twice to fully collapse everything so that I can see all of the groups and subgroups that are available to me. And if there's an arrow, that means that there's a subgroup underneath it or, or something that's coded underneath it. So this B2, B.02 is investments and then we have different subgroups underneath that. And that is because we want to make sure that we're linking our financial statements wherever possible to these subgroups so that we have the detail in there. So depending on the level of detail the client wants to see in the financial statements will dictate whether or not we have more or fewer of these particular subgroups under the main grouping headings. So accounts receivable has subgroups for the full grossed up accounts receivable, the allowance for doubtful accounts because that way we can link them both separately in the different parts of the face of the financial statements and in the notes. But in this case, I'm looking for, I have donations that need to be grouped. So I'm gonna go down to the revenue section and I'm gonna find donations go in the contribution section. So there are two ways that I can group that. I can click on the donation and then click on the group that I wanted to go into and hit the arrow to the right and it is now gone into this listing. The other option that I have is a cut and paste. So my next one to group is health insurance. So that is an employee benefit. So I'm going to come down here and try to find where those employee benefits are. And that's the grouping that I want them to go into. I'm going to click on health insurance and I'm going to click on the group I want to go to and I'm going to move the arrow to the right. Now let's say for some reason that this long term, just this life insurance, I don't like the section that it's in, it doesn't belong there. I can either click on it and hit the left arrow to ungroup the account, which takes it over there. But I want to move it back because that's really truly where it belongs. 
Or, rather than pushing it over here and then moving it right back to the right, I can actually right click on it and cut that account and then move to the tab that it belongs to and right click and paste. So now you can see that the salaries number now includes this life insurance. It belong there, so I'm going to cut it again and I'm going to move it back to the employee benefits. And then I'm going to hit close and it's going to refresh. And now when I go to the bottom, because I'm fully grouped, 131,239 is now what my TB database is showing for my net income. And if I go back over to my prepared by client trial balance, I now match. Now one of the things that can be a little daunting sometimes to individuals is the account groupings. So what we usually say is if you're not sure, you can always ask somebody where an account goes, but you can also, also just print out the listing of the new accounts or do a screenshot of the new accounts, group them where you think that they go, and then give your reviewer that screenshot or that listing of the new accounts, and then they can double check where you put those new accounts. And let's say that you get a trial balance from a client and it's not in an Excel format, so it's not something that we're going to be able to import and we're going to have to manually key the financial, key those numbers into the database, which is not preferable. If at all possible, we're going to try and convert any file we get over to an Excel file to be able to import. But if you are not able to do that, right now I cannot, as, as each of these columns are white, I am not al allowed to change them and you'll see that it gets an error message that I have to be in TB edit mode in order to be able to change anything that's in the database. In order to get into TB edit mode, I stay on this engagement ribbon at the top and I choose TB edit mode. And then anything that is highlighted in this teal blue color, I can technically change the dollar amount to something different. But just make sure that if you are manually keying anything into this database, that you continue to come down to zero at the end so that you know that everything is in balance. The other thing to note about the TB database is it does also show us prior period final numbers and in some cases prior period tax. We can modify which columns are presented in the TB database. And let's say that there's a column that you want to be able to see that it's not currently showing or there's an, a column that we don't need to see anymore. You, you just have to stay on this engagement ribbon and go to the TB column setup. and then. The items here in the right window are those that are going to show up and be presented in the TB database. So let's say that I don't need to see the um, final federal from the first prior period. And you can see there's the name, the abbreviated. This will tell us what period we're relating to. So it's last year's period, first prior period, final tax. Let's say I don't need to see that, so I'm going to move and use this left arrow to remove that column. So now whenever I reopen this, I'm just going to see my first prior period final, which would be matched to my audited numbers, my unadjusted, which are the client um, provided numbers, my adjusting journal entries, my adjusted balance after those adjusting journal entries, my reclassifying journal entries column, final balance, which will flow to our financial statements, whether there are any federal journal entries booked, and then the federal tax balance. So now you'll see that first prior period tax column has now been removed from the database. And keep in mind it is just as easy to add it back in should it accidentally be removed and you somebody else wants to be able to see it again. If you find that there is a need to change something about one of the accounts, whether it is changing the account number or the account description, you can go to this button here for the chart of accounts which will pull up each of the accounts that are listed with their account description and then also the unadjusted balance that's in there too and you can modify any of them through this window pane. You can also delete accounts and add new accounts to this as well. So if we need to add a new account for financial statement presentation purposes that maybe the client doesn't have that account, you can click on new and it'll take you to the bottom where you can enter in um, an account number and then a description. And then just remember that if you do add a new account, you'll have to go back to the account groupings tab because any new accounts will show up as ungrouped accounts and will need to be grouped in with our groupings. One other piece to note, sorry about the account groupings, is that you will notice that the, the letters for each respective section, those correspond 
with the, tie, the, the letters for each of our tabs to make it a little bit easier. So as we mentioned before, the C section of the binder is accounts receivable. The C section of our groupings is also accounts receivable. So now that we've successfully imported our trial balance and grouped all ungrouped accounts, we're going to go ahead and minimize the TB database and we're going to go back to our binder and we're going to open up the TB report. And this is where we'll be able to see where all those groupings come in to help us. At first glance, you'll see there are no, are no numbers in this particular report, and that's because this is pulling from the other, the for-profit TB database. So we actually need to create a TB report for that TB NFP, which is the one that we imported into. So go to your engagement. You can do this inside of any, any Excel file within the engagement binder. Go to the engagement ribbon, choose TB setup, and we're going to go down to create and choose trial balance reports. And then we are going to include change the radio dial to include current and future. We want a classified report and what that means is it'll subtotal for us between current assets, current liabilities, it'll balance between the assets, the rev assets, liabilities, and equity as well too. On the report type we want to choose detail because we want to have uh, that detail in there and then on the trial balance we want to choose the TB NFP to create so that way it comes from the one that we just imported to. And actually I'm going to have to redo these two pieces and choose detail and then it's going to default to go into the unfiled work paper section so I'm going to go ahead and change that to make life a little bit easier and choose trial balance report and I'm going to go ahead and give it a work paper index number of 3100.011 and we chose lead and sublead because that's the grouping that we want to have the report go off of and that should be everything that we will need. So I'm going to hit OK. And it says the report was created successfully. And I'm going to go ahead and close this TV report, which since it's not the one that I want. And now I'm going to go back to my binder view. And you can see that we now have a new report here, which is the TV NFP combined report. I'm going to open that one up. And you can see, actually, we made a little bit of an error. I made a little bit of an error in creating that report because it only shows me my final federal tax balance. And that's not what I want to see. So I'm going to go back up to engagement, go back to TB setup, and I'm going to go back to create reports and back to create trial balance report. I'm going to choose my TB NFP. And I'm going to choose lead and sublead classified report select all and detail and what I failed to do on the first time so learn from my mistakes is that right now the report only generates with the federal tax balance in there well that's actually not the balance that I want to not the columns that I want on that TB report so I'm going to go ahead and bump that over we want the unadjusted which is the client we want to list all of our AJEs or adjusting journal entries we want the adjusted balance I'm going to move that over we want our reclassifying entries to show here as well, and then we want the final balance to show on this particular report. And then we also want some comparative information, so I'm going to choose first prior period final, and I'm going to move that over. But I want that first prior period final to be the furthest column to the left, the first one I see. So now, since it's on the bottom, that would put it to the farthest to the right. So I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to use the up arrow to move it to the top, and hit OK. and the report was created successfully and this time it actually is down in the unfiled section because I didn't give it its new index name so I'm gonna move it to the top by hitting cut coming up here and choosing paste and because I need to give it an index number because all of our work papers need to have a description and an index number I'm gonna click on that work paper and I'm gonna right click and go to properties and I'm going to give it the index number what, and hit OK. And then I'm going to take this first one that I made that wasn't correct and I'm going to right click and I'm going to delete it. Oh, actually, I have to close it first. So I can either go over here and close it by getting to this work paper or the other option you have is to right click on it within the binder. And if it was still open, there would be a close the close work paper option is another way that you can get that to close down. 
So this time I'm going to go ahead and close that one work paper. And we're going to go and open up our new TB report, which will show our imported numbers and grouped in a way that matches to our financial statements. And so as another learning experience, there's one other piece. If you see how in this report there are a lot of accounts with zero balances, well, we don't want to have all those show because it just takes up space for information that's not helpful to us. So we're going to try this one last time. Go back to TB Setup. We're going to go to Create, Create Trial Balance Report. And we're going to choose, it's from the TB NFP. And I'm going to go... Go ahead and change the name. Give it its index number. I'm going to tell that I want it in the 3100 section. I'm just keep it on lead and sublead. I want to include all a classified report. I want it detailed. And we go to funds. There's nothing I have to change there. Settings. This is the part that I didn't do the first time. I want to hide empty groups and subgroups. I want to hide accounts with zero balances. And I want to show the work paper reference columns. And then I'm going to go to format columns. This remains the same because it remembered it from the last time. And so now this time I hit OK. Report was successfully created. I'm going to close this report that we don't like. I'm going to go back to my binder view. And I'm going to delete the bad report. And I'm going to open the new one. And this time you will see that there are no accounts that have zero balances for both years and there are no subgroups with zero balances. And now, whenever we get, there will be another training video done on how to link the financial statements. But these subgroups are what we use to link to the so on this particular client, whenever you link to their financial statements, you will see that their cash account is going to be listed as this $153,857. Now as we're going through and working on the audit, if we discover the need for, an, for a journal entry, inside of any Excel file you can go back to this engagement tab and you can go to the journal entry summary. And in that journal entry summary is how we will start the process for writing and drafting a new journal entry. If it's an AJE, like I said, if it's an AJE, which is an adjusting journal entry, that is an adjustment we want our client to make. If it's, an R, if it's an adjustment that we want to make just for financial statement presentation purposes, it's an RJE and we'll put it in this, in this folder. Our FJEs are our federal tax journal entry, so an adjustment that's needed just for tax return purposes. And then our PAJEs, our PAGEs, are our adjustments that we noted that there was a difference, but it's immaterial and so we are passing on adjusting it, but we still want to accumulate them if they meet the criteria for accumulation, which will be addressed in a different training. As far as numbering journal entries, and this is addressed in the 000 section of this binder in one of the handouts, but adjusting journal entries will start with a, a 1, and all of our journal entries have a three-digit number. So adjusting journal entries, AJE, would start with 101, then 102, then 103. Reclassifying entries start with a 2. So you go 201, 202, 203, depending on how many you have to, to write. The federal journal entries start with threes, 301, 302, and so on. And then our past adjustments start with fours, 401, 402, and so on. And the reason we chose it is because one, two, three, four, to make it easier. So we know that all AJEs start with a one, all RJEs start with a two, all FJEs start with a three, and all PAGEs start with a four. If you need to book a new entry, you're going to click on the folder that you want, and you're going to choose New. And then the journal entry, you will change it to 101, since this is an adjusting journal entry. You will always need to put in a work paper reference for where the source is for this journal entry. And then once that's done, then you need to put a description for the journal entry in there as well. And then once you've done that, then you'll come down here, and you can start typing in to find... the account that you want to book. 
and you'll see right now I can't click on anything because it's assuming that I'm on a different TB database. So I actually need to cancel. No, I don't want to save because I should have chosen the correct database. Now once again in most binders you're only going to have one TB database so you won't have to worry about this. But if you do have one that there are multiple, whether it be a consolidated binder, make sure you're choosing the right TB database. So I'm going to do this again. I chose the right TB database. I'm choosing AJE and I'm going to say Journal Entry 101 and I'm going to do, um, let's pretend that it was a work paper A01 that we noted this difference and we're going to adjust Let's say if it didn't match the bank reconciliation. So I'm going to at this point now choose the cash account that needs to be adjusted and I would record my debits and my credits and then I would choose the other side of the entry and let's say that we're going to run it through it was late charges that didn't get recorded and so tab through. Now you can um, search so by account number, so if I know that it's account 1002, you'll see that it starts to auto-populate, so you can search within the within the account to choose which one is the correct one to book your piece. But because this first state bank account, I don't want that, want that on there, I'm going to choose delete to get that line off. And then I would put in my debit and credit dollar amount, and then I would hit save and close. And then now you can see that I have a journal entry up there that's sitting and recording. If I decide later on that that journal entry is not required and I need to delete it, I'll click on it and I'll choose the delete button. It'll ask me if I'm sure and I will hit yes or no. So in this way we'll choose yes. And hit close. And I want to show you the journal entry report. So we're going to go back actually to that journal entry summary. I'm going to push it back to the TBNFP and I'm going to choose an AJE. I'm going to choose new. I'm going to choose that first state bank account and I'm going to book the entry for a dollar even though you would never really book an entry for a dollar unless you're trying to get net assets to roll properly and then you are going to go ahead and choose the other side which we're going to run it through I'll just pick a an expense account and I'm going to hit save and close and close And then now you'll see once this refreshes, here in a second, AJE 101 is now reflected in here. And you can see that total and it's now a new adjusted balance for that particular account. And then if you want to see a snapshot of all the journal entries that have been recorded, then you would click on these particular adjusting journal entries reports. Now this, this adjusting journal entry report was created off of the TB database, not the NFP TB database. So all I have to do in order to see that and create a new report the same way as before, I'm going to go to TB setup and I'm going to go to create, but instead of trial balance report, I'm going to choose journal entry reports. And you can do more than one at a time, which is great. So I'm going to choose adjusting journal entries, I want reclassifying journal entries, and I want my past adjustments, but I want them for this TBNFP that I imported to. So adjusting journal entries, reclassifying journal entries, and past adjustments. And I want them to go into the 3200 section because that's where we house all of our journal entries. And I do not want to combine into one report. Okay, and I'm going to hit Okay, and it's going to refresh each one and say the reports were successfully created. I'm going to close this report that wasn't based upon my database, go back to the binder, and you will see that I now have three new account reports. So I'm going to go ahead and give them an index number for that one. Reclassifying, I'm going to put it. And my past adjustments, go to properties, oh, I want the 
capacity doesn't be two. I'm going to put the reclassifying journal entries to three one so that they line up with the other one. Now once again, typically you won't have all of these different setups. I just put these as the next number one so they would go in the right in the right order, but typically your adjusting journal entries are going to be the 3200.01 and so on and so forth down. Um, so now, because this one, I'm going to go to the properties too and I'm going to add on here so that we know that this is related to the NFP TB database. But if I open up that NFP TB database, it now populates and shows the one adjusting journal entry that we have recorded. Now we're going to look at some of the features that engagement has for work paper documentation. We're going to go back to the binder view and we're going to go ahead and open up one of our work papers down in the substantive section. So just for example purposes, I'm going to open up this Excel file, this accounts receivable role down in our C section to show some of the features for engagement when it comes to inserting work paper references and linking. Now this work paper is for a different client, so the numbers do not agree to the trial balance that we imported, but we can show some different features that we have available there. So let's say that this number goes to another work paper. So we can insert work paper reference right here. And let's say that that number agrees over to something that is in our AR analytics, so C1.02. So I put in that work paper reference number there to know that this number I'm now going to see over on this work paper. This number I'm going to see over on this work paper. And then now that it's there, I can right click and choose open work paper reference and it's going to open up that other work paper for us. Another feature of engagement is the ability to in, uh, insert a TB link. So let's say I choose right click and I start choose insert TB link. I'm going to make sure I have the right trial balance selected so I'm going to choose my TB NFP and let's then choose lead and sublead. I'm going to choose account groupings because then that's going to match the groupings that were in there. But if I also, you have other options too. You can just choose account type. So if you just want to have the total for the assets or liabilities or revenue or expenses, you would choose account type. Account class, same thing, current assets, current liabilities, breaks it down that way. Or if you need to drill down and link just one particular account number, you can do it with just the account detail, but we're going to stay with the account groupings. It'll automatically default to current. It will automatically default to unadjusted balance. So you want to drop that down to your final balance because in that way, any journal entries that were recorded during our process will be reflected in the number that's being linked in. And because this is an AR work paper, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down to my C section and pick AR. Now you can hit insert and it'll show that this particular AR grouping has a total of $2,167. It's a debit balance. But let's say I was inserting something that was a liability. It would come through as a negative number. So you can choose your sign options, whether it's the actual, the reversal of the sign, or absolute value. And then you choose paste and then close. And then the 2167 shows up in your report, in your work paper now. And as a general rule of thumb, whenever we are uh, linking, a, inserting a TB link into one of our work papers, we usually like to shade the cell gray, which signifies to the reviewer that it is something that has been linked to the trial balance. So if you use that insert TB link option, just make sure you, sh you shade the cell gray. And then if something has been TB linked and you want to see what's making up that number, you can right click on it and choose drill down TB link and it will show you all of the accounts that are in that number. And usually you do have to shift the columns over a little bit to be able to see the dollar amounts that are in there. So I'm going to hit close. One other piece regarding our work papers which will be addressed in a separate training is our work paper referencing. So if something is going to a work paper, you're going to put it on the right of that number or on the bottom of that number. And if um, it is coming from another work paper, it would be on the left or on the top of that number. 
This is a point of reference. And then whenever a number ties out to the trial balance, you're either going to write TB next to it, or you're going to put the work paper number of the TB, the trial balance report. Not the trial balance database, but the actual trial balance report in the 3100 section that it specifically agrees to. And then one last thing of engagement when it comes to benefits for the work papers are the tick marks that are available inside there. So if you need a check mark to help document your testing um, of, of a procedural test that you've done, then you can use the check mark that's here. If you um, have two things that agree to each other, you usually you will use letters with those. So you could use an A and an A to show that two different numbers agree to each other. So if I had 2167 over here based upon data that the client provided and I want to show that it agrees to the same number down here, I would put an A to an A, an A up here, and then an A down here. And you want to try to get it as close to the left of that as possible. If you need to add up numbers, we sum with uh, numbers. So you would choose find the number one, and put ones next to everything, and then you would choose the summation symbol, which is right here, and put that next to the number one, and then put the summation right here. So, but once again, tick mark usage and firm standards for that will be addressed in a separate training, but just wanted to bring that up since it is um, a possibility, well, since we were in an actual current work paper. Another thing too is that as you're in a work paper and you discover that you need to write a journal entry, you do have these shortcuts. We use the journal entry summary before to see each of the different journal entry options, but you can also just choose add journal entry as well. And you can choose, it defaults to adjusting journal entries, but you can just change the drop down to reclassifying or whatever the journal entry needs to be. And no, I don't want to save those changes because I don't want to book that journal entry. I'm going to go ahead, and go ahead and close this work paper because those are the things that we need to show on there. And then that wraps up the basics training for engagement. As always, if you have any questions, please always feel free to reach out to your supervisor or your coach, and he or she should be able to help and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.